Let me give you a little background as to why I would title a talk like that and um, discuss a man so directly. I have had people over the last two years, ever since Ted Wilson became the president of the General Conference, I have had people in various parts of the world either email me or write me letters. And they said, Bill, this man seems to be so solid should we go back to the denomination? <laughs> Folk, I've had, as I said, I've had letters or emails from all over the world. Well, I didn't say anything. I just would counsel them and encourage them and so on. Well, about three months ago, a man from Australia sent me an email. And I've met him. He's a delightful gentleman named Trevor. He's actually from England. But he uh, went to Australia many, many years ago. And I've met him and his wife, Sharon, uh, for the last five years when I've been in Australia. So he emailed me and he said, Bill, I have a real problem. He said, there are people in Australia that are sending me emails and they are saying to me, you need to get back into the denomination. And the reason why is because Ted Wilson is riding the ship and everything is moving forward in the right direction. And what are you doing remaining outside of the denomination? Now he was very concerned because I know Trevor, he is a very honest, a very honest man, very straightforward. You know exactly where you stand with Trevor. So he said, would you please prepare something so that people can understand what is going on ever since Ted Wilson became the General Conference President? I said, I will. And so that's why I put together this program. Now having said that, I want to make a couple of things extremely clear. This is not about Ted Wilson, the man. I was in Tennessee three months ago, and in an afternoon meeting, a lady raised her hand, almost with tears in her eyes, and she said, you know, I don't like to hear unkind things about Ted Wilson. She said, many, many years ago, when my family and I were moving, he was the pastor of our church. And as we were getting ready to move, he took time out of his busy schedule to come over and help us to load our truck. Amen. Well, I looked at her and I said, ma'am, I am very happy that you shared that story. And I said, ma'am, I want you to understand that I have never met Ted Wilson. I have tried to speak with him. I have called the General Conference to try and speak with him but was not given that opportunity. I don't know him personally. And this material today is not about this man as a person. I hope you all understand that. You say, now wait a minute, Bill. Doesn't the Bible say when, when, King, when David was a fugitive and Abishai said, you know, thrust through the, the arrow and, and pin him to the ground. And David said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Are you not touching the Lord's anointed? Folk, again, and I, will, I may say this during the entire program, this is not about a man. This is not about him as a person, as an individual. These are about issues. These are about principles. These are about the message that we've been given as a people. That's what this meeting is about. And the question is, is that, is this man, since he has become the General Conference President, has he, through 
the programs he has sought to uh, support and promote, and through the messages that he has given both at the General Conference in 2010 and subsequent meetings, has the things that he has stood for been the promotion of the messages that make us the distinct people that we are today. Now does everybody understand the distinction that I'm making and the direction that I'm going to be taking in this program? Amen. I hope you do. I hope you do. Ted Wilson was elected the 20th president of the General Conference June 25th, 2010. In his opening sermon at the General Conference session, he highlighted so many things that faithful Seventh-day Adventists could appreciate. He focused on many things. Number one, the righteousness of Christ. Now which one of us is going to disagree with the focus on the righteousness of Christ? If we're going to disagree with that, then we have a problem. A big one. He focused on our foundation as the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. He focused on the sanctuary, the Sabbath, and the Ten Commandments. And he focused on the final triumph of the great Advent message. Now, can we all agree with those things? Those are all good things. And those are all messages that I hope we're sharing with other people. Many people were so thrilled with this message that many independent Adventists were openly questioning, should I go back to the denomination? Has God raised up this man that I need to support? Is this possibly another Josiah raised up to curb widespread apostasy? Now for those of you who may not be familiar with this name, Josiah was basically the last faithful king in Israel, in Judah, which was the southern kingdom, prior to the Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. Now, after Josiah died in a battle, his sons came into office, and his sons were like Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And all three of them were very unfaithful to their call as kings in Israel. So people were saying, is Ted Wilson possibly another Josiah who is going to curb the apostasy amongst us as a people? Many people were asking that question. Now, in all fairness, and I'm going to very much try to do this in the course of this meeting, because he obviously is not here to defend himself. So I want to be as fair as is possible with the principles and the messages that this man has given. Now, with all the good that was said in the first sermon by Ted Wilson, there were three things of note to analyze in that first meeting. Number one, actually I've got two here. Throughout that first sermon, and you can go back and listen to it on YouTube. I've listened to it two or three times. In his oft-repeated mention of the three angels' messages, he never once specified who Babylon is in Revelation 14.8. In commenting on the third angel's message, he never once specified who the beast and his image were in Revelation 14, 9 to 12. And folks, as we continue, that becomes very important. Now, see, all of these things right here, the righteousness of Christ, the foundation of the Bible and spirit of prophecy, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, and the triumph of the Advent message. Basically, folks, you're going to find these aspects in the first angel's message. That's where you're going to find the focus of these messages. Now maybe not the spirit of prophecy, 
uh, or the, the triumph of the Advent message. But obviously the spirit of prophecy talks about those other elements. But the righteousness of Christ, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the health message are all found in the first angel's message. But in the oft-repeated statements where he mentions in his first sermon about the three angels' messages, he never once makes a specific statement about who Babylon is, nor does he make a specific statement about who the beast is and who the image is in Revelation 14.9. It's very significant, folks, in light of the direction that Seventh-day Adventism has been taking for the last 60 years. It's very, very significant. The reason I say that is because there have been a few occasions that Bud alluded to today when we have done a mass mailing into a different communities in Oregon and in Arizona, etc. And in response to the mass mailing of the books, local Seventh-day Adventist churches have written large articles in those towns newspapers and what the Seventh-day Adventists will always say in those local newspapers number one they will denounce the books that I've written which is not an issue at all as far as I'm concerned but then this is what they say they say we are health conscious we believe in the love of Jesus Christ. We believe in setting aside one day in the week for rest and worship. We believe that we have a loving mediator in the sanctuary in heaven. Now, folk, in the same breath, when they mention those several things, they will then denounce the anti-Christian focus of the enemy unmasked and the secret terrorist that dares to pinpoint religious groups in the world that are, according to the author, not following God. Do you see what I'm saying there? See, Seventh-day Adventists today, many Seventh-day Adventists today, They'll talk about hell. They'll talk about loving Jesus. They'll talk about one day in seven for rest. They'll even mention that Jesus is our mediator in heaven. Okay? Which are all part of the first angel's message. But we were not given the one angel message flying in the midst of heaven, were we? We were given the three angels' messages to declare to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So if we're giving the first and not the second or the third, we're giving 33% of the message. Is that a faithful delineation of the messages of God? No, it's not. What Ted Wilson gave in Atlanta that made people wonder if this was our next Josiah? He gave 33% of our message, folks. And that hasn't stopped since Atlanta. Now, in the sermon in July of 2010, he said this, stay away from non-biblical spiritual disciplines or methods of spiritual formation that are rooted in mysticism such as contemplating prayer, centering prayer, and the emerging church movement in which they're promoted. Okay, so he says stay away from these things. Can we all agree with that? Absolutely, we better. <laughs> now this was his counsel. He said stay away from this. Well, if we're going to stay away from that, where do we look for help and courage and support? This is what he said. Look within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. Now let's go on. 
Notice this statement. This is quoted from www.adventist.org or ANN News, February 3rd of 2004. It's also in Rick Howard's book, The Omega Rebellion, page 136. By the way, Rick Howard uh, just retired. He was a Seventh-day Adventist minister for over 30 years. Okay? And throughout his book, Rick Howard bends over backwards to let everybody know that he is a faithful Seventh-day Adventist who loves the denomination. Okay? Well, this is what he says. Listen carefully. And I want you to hopefully keep it connected with Ted Wilson said, stay away from spiritual formation. Just look within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay? Notice this statement from the Adventist.org, the ANN News, February 3 of 2004. It says, the Adventist World Church created the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education in September of 2001. So there was a board created. And what was the purpose of the board? Well, it was designed to provide overall guidance and standards to the professional training of pastors, evangelists, theologians, teachers, chaplains, and other denominational employees involved in ministerial and religious formation or... What's that? Or spiritual formation in each of the church's 13 regions around the world. Now what did that just say? That just said that 11 years ago, the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education was created at the General Conference in September of 2001, and the purpose of that board was to train Seventh-day Adventist pastors, evangelists, theologians, teachers, chaplains, and other denominational employees in spiritual formation. So for the last 11 years, Seventh-day Adventist leaders across the board are being educated and trained in spiritual formation. Now, I had a lady from the U.S. Virgin Islands. She does some research for me on occasion. I said, I need you to find for me who were the people on that board in September of 2001. I have that literature. You need it. I have it too. You guys both have that? Yes, I do too. Okay. Well, you know what? She sent me a copy. <laughs> She sent me a list of the people that were on the board in 2001. Now notice this one right here. Calvin Rock, Eugene Sue, uh, Humberto Rossi, James Crest, Jan Paulson, Matthew Bodego, Robert Rawson, Richard Steinbachen, George Reed. Now notice this one right here. Ted Wilson. Ted Wilson was on the committee that voted Stop. to have spiritual formation come in amongst us. Now, somebody says, oh, but wait a minute. Did Ted Wilson vote yes for spiritual formation to be taught to all Adventist leaders? Did he do that? You know what, friend? That information, as far as I know, is not available. Yeah. And if anybody else has that, you don't have it. Okay. My point here is this. Whether or whether not the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists voted yay or nay for spiritual formation is not the issue. The issue, friends, is this. Is that 11 years after 
This man was on the committee to bring spiritual formation into Seventh-day Adventism. He said in his first sermon, stay away from spiritual formation. And where did he tell people to look? Within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now folks, how could you tell somebody to look within the Adventist church to stay away from spiritual formation just look within the church where all the leaders are taught in spiritual formation. How can you do that? That doesn't make sense, Ben. Folks, I would liken that to a fox in a hen house. That is like telling chickens to go into a hen house even though you know there are dozens of foxes in the hen house. A boat. That. That's horrible. That's horrible. The council would be look to the Bible, look to the spirit of prophecy. Don't trust men. Amen. Period. Amen. Don't trust men. Look to Christ, He is our leader. That would be the counsel that you would have expected. But to tell the people, stay away from spiritual formation, just look within the church and trust the leaders that have taken spiritual formation. Friend, that's, that's insanity. It's insanity. Now, those who brought spiritual formation in, the committee that brought it in, just to let you know a little bit about spiritual formation, this is taken from Lewis Walton's book, Omega 2. He, of course, was the famous Seventh-day Adventist lawyer that wrote Omega back in the early 1980s. This is what he said. This is the basis of spiritual formation. Loyola's whole religious life centered around his meditation. He is said to have believed that he had revelations from God every day. He authored a volume that's still in print entitled The Spiritual Exercise of Ignatius Loyola, a series of meditations by which one is supposed to purge the soul and find oneness with God. He spends hours in mystical meditation under the control of a director. And within a month, his mind has begun to accept the concept of absolute submission. Submission to whom? Malachi Martin says that after going through the rigors of the spiritual exercises, each man emerged from that week's long regimen as a spiritual fighter, completely won over to warfare, an entirely obedient servant of the Pope. So, folk, in the last 10 to 11 years within Seventh-day Adventism, we wonder why is it that we don't hear about the Antichrist? Why is it that we don't know or hear anymore about the image in Revelation 13 or in Revelation 14? Why don't we hear about apostate Protestantism? Why don't we hear the distinctive messages that separate us like a cleaver from the rest of the world. Why? Because the leadership in taking spiritual formation are becoming obedient servants, not of God, but of the Pope himself. We wonder why Ellen White in Review and Herald, March 18, 1884, could write such an alarming statement as this, friend, and how this could ever happen amongst us as a people. It says, the Lord has a controversy with his professed people in these last days. Those are Seventh-day Adventists. In this controversy, men in responsible positions will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah. They will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, 
This is talking about Seventh-day Adventists. But they will try to keep it from others by burying it beneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches, Seventh-day Adventist churches, and in large gatherings in the open air, those are called camp meetings, Seventh-day Adventist ministers will urge upon the Seventh-day Adventist people the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. How can it be, friends, that a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, full well knowing that anybody who embraces the sign of Sunday rebellion against God will suffer the seven last plagues? How could a Seventh-day Adventist ever tell another Adventist to keep Sunday? That's exactly right, Melanie. NLP and spiritual formation. Now, let's take a look at another issue. The Great Controversy Project. This is a quote from Delbert W. Baker. Delbert W. Baker is a general vice president for the World Church of Seventh-day Adventists. He chairs the Great Controversy Project Committee, discusses the worldwide initiative to distribute Ellen G. White's book, The Great Controversy, disseminating its lasting message to a world in need of hope. Okay, so now Delbert Baker is going to talk to us about getting the great controversy out to the world. Listen to what he says. Excuse me. That's what our general conference president, Ted Wilson, was referring to when he preached his first message in Atlanta. Do something big and bold for God. Under God, we need to do something bold and get our message out in a very powerful and distinct way. We must tell the world about the message God has given us by sending millions of copies of the great controversy around the globe. We, we think that can be accomplished. President Wilson has challenged all the divisions of the world field, all the departments in the General Conference, all the entities, hospitals, health systems, schools, layman services, industries, independent ministries, publishing houses, supporting organizations to help us in spreading the great controversy like the leaves of autumn. Now, how many of us can disagree with that? Isn't that an awesome project? That's a fantastic project. Yes, Sharita. I understand that the conference redid the great controversy different from what it was when Ellen G. White wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Sharita? That was a Paul. That's the next slide. Sharita, let me tell you. I have a copy. I went to the local Adventist Book Center in Mount Dora, and I asked the man there, I said, uh, have you heard about the Great Controversy Project? He said, oh yeah. I said, I've heard that there have been some changes in, in the Great Controversy book, just like what you just said. He said, uh, yeah, there have been a lot of changes. Now, the normal Great Controversy book is nearly 784, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. That's it. This is the original. Yeah, um, the, the 1911 that I have, it's nearly 700 pages long. This is the Great Controversy book that the General Conference is promoting. Well, <laughs> the first page, the last page, what's the drawn? Fred, that's about it. That's about it. Folk, you know, when I was in Ohio over about a year ago, I gave a talk in the afternoon on spiritual formation in which I mentioned Ted Wilson. When I got done at the end of the meeting, a gentleman right over there where Vance is, I can still see him, his name was Tony. 
Tony raised his hand. He said, but, you know, Pastor Bill, I understand about spiritual formation, but he said, Elder Wilson is really pushing the, the circulating of the Great Controversy Project. And he's going to get out over a hundred million copies of that book. I said, Tony, if that's true, that's great. But even back then, and I told Tony that day, I said, I'm hearing that they have left out huge portions of the Great Controversy book. And they use new Bible translations. Well, oh, absolutely, Robert. Absolutely. Now, folks, notice in this statement, notice in this statement that it's repeated that they are going to get out millions of copies of the great controversy. And so for a Seventh-day Adventist reading that statement, we're saying, the seven, nearly 700-page book is going to go to over 125 million homes around the world? Awesome! Fantastic! Sorry. Going on. Going on. This is Delbert Baker still. He says the third benefit of the great controversy is that it has had a way of applying history in a very practical fashion to our lives. So when we read the story about Zwingli, Luther, Calvin, the Reformation, lessons are not simply relegated to the distant past, but they can be applied to our lives today. Now did you notice those four things that Elder Baker mentioned? He said stories about Zwingli, Luther, Calvin, the Reformation. Now all of that, folk, is in the great controversy. You know what? It's not in here. It's not in here. At this point, I think it's kind of appropriate. When I got... Are they going to send the rest later or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. To be continued. You know what? Interesting you asked that tongue-in-cheek. A guy in Australia, he came up to me after we talked about this great controversy project. He said that very thing. He said, Bill, you know what I think it is? He said, I think they're using this book as the entering wedge. And then after people get a taste in their mouth and, and they get excited about what they read, then they're going to write in and they're going to say, I like the big edition of the book. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I think you've missed the point. The point is not the method of evangelism. Whether this is the entering wedge or whether this is the last wedge. The point is, is that the general conference has deceived Seventh-day Adventists worldwide. That's the issue. They're potting it off as though they are going to be sharing the entire great controversy when they are sending out this. It's a misrepresentation, which another word for that is deception. A lie. A lie. A lie. That's exactly right. What's that? Yeah, won't that backfire once everybody knows and then that book is out? Is that going to backfire though? On the, on no, they do spiritual formation so well that they've got everything pretty much. Well, not you know what? everybody. A lot of people. <laughs> you know, Cindy, a lady in Canada who from what I can... I'll read you a little bit of this. This is uh, two or three pages, maybe even more. Yeah, it's four pages. I'm not going to read it all. But this, this gentleman, listen to what he says. He says, hijacked, rip-off, fit to be tied. Those are three of the epitaphs we have heard in recent days in reference to the vaunted Great Controversy Project. 
As announced by General Conference President Ted Wilson in Atlanta in July of 2010, uh, he goes on, he says, um, he gives some history, uh, and then he says, uh, that's where we all heard and applauded Elder Wilson as he pledged to bring this book before the world. To me, it was a defining moment in his early presidency. If this is what our new president was bringing to the table, then all was not lost in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Most of us watching felt that way. The Amen said so. The excited discussions, email, text messages. It was a breath of fresh air. But what happened? What turned our euphoria into outright anger? Having spoken to a key insider this morning, I can tell you this much. What he and millions around the world thought was coming simply has not materialized. The book being pushed has been renamed <laughs> The Great Hope. And it is all of 11 chapters long with almost all of the condemnation of Roman Catholicism gone. Huss, gone. Jerome, gone. Luther, gone. Zwingli, gone. The Reformation, gone. The early Advent message and movement, gone. The multiple martyrdoms and wickedness of Rome, gone. As one brother told me just now, that's not the great controversy, and they shouldn't be allowed to call it the great controversy project. That is false advertising, plain and simple. Now, I could read, this is four pages, the gentleman goes on. Here is the ad that I was given the day that the guy at the local ABC in Mount Dora gave me the great hope. This was the ad that was being sent out all over the world. I want to read just a little bit to you. It says this, it has happened too many times to count. Someone stumbles across a copy of the great controversy and soon they are baptized in the church fellowship. Now is that true? Absolutely it's true. The Great Controversy, what an awesome book, brought thousands and thousands and thousands of people into the Seventh-day Adventist message. But the Great Hope, was this the book that brought those people into Adventism? No, no. But it's pawned off as though it is. It goes on. It's the story of some of the outstanding spiritual leaders of the church. John Bradshaw and David Asher. I can guarantee you that John Bradshaw and David Asher did not read this book that made them Seventh-day Adventists. But this ad is saying that it did. And then the quote. Ellen White herself wrote I am more anxious to see a wide circulation for this book than for any others I have written. For in the great controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any of my other books. Cole Porter Ministry, page 127. Now again, folks, when Ellen White wrote that, was she talking about this book? Yeah. <laughs> she wasn't here. She was talking about the 1884 Great Conference. Yeah. See, to apply this and say that this brought John Bradshaw and David Ashry into the Advent message, and it was this book that Ellen White promoted to be sent all over the world. Friends, again, that's a lie. It is a flat out lie and deception. To deception. Also, the Bible that Ted Wilson says that he promotes when he wrote his article in Review 
guess what Bible he quotes out of? In New age. American Standard Version. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, Roberta. I saw it. I, I've been putting this up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I, 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 I kept telling everybody, I said, you know, if he's not a Josiah, he is the greatest deception that has come off on us. Mm -hmm. And the more I kept seeing this was being said, also in his speech, do you know that he relegated all of our teachings or any new teaching to the BRI, the Biblical Research Institute? And what uh, message was that? His first one. Was it? Mm -hmm. okay. It's at the tail end. Okay. I'll have to go back. I didn't hear that, but I, I can go back and listen to that. Actually, in that picture, it looks like a much beefier book. I think it's so Go back and it looks like a... This one right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is a deception. That is really So, wait a minute. You, you held up one that said the hope? hope oh, the great hope. 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 It's like the same, but it's different. Hold okay. it up next to the bell. <laughs> that must be the third edition or something. Well, that must be a whole case of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's kind of sneaky. Right that is so vulnerable. <laughs> Come a little closer and you'll find it smaller. <laughs> the great help, folks. Guts the message of the true great controversy. It leaves out the chapters that deal with the early Christian era, the Dark Ages, Huss, Wycliffe, the Reformation, the early rise of Adventism. It never clearly discloses the wording of the papal anti-Christian system. It's a bold-faced lie and deception, for it isn't the great controversy we know. It leaves out the distinctive truths that makes the great controversy the book that it is. You know, folks, the thing that I find in a trend from the first sermon by the President of the General Conference <coughs> to this project is the, the obliterating from the minds of Seventh-day Adventists the last two messages that we've been given as a people. In this book, you do not see clearly that the image of the beast or Babylon of Revelation 14.8 is the apostate Protestant churches of today. It's not clear in this book. And it was not in the first sermon, even though the first sermon was on the three angels' messages. In this book, you do not see, and I've read this book, you do not see clearly who the Antichrist is. You do not see who the beast is of Revelation 14. Can I tell you who the synagogue of Satan is? That I don't remember. I was specifically, Melanie, looking for direct references to the second and third angels' messages. And they're not there. It wasn't in his opening sermon. It's not in this book. And folks, what, what I'm seeing in these things is there has been a concerted drive within the denomination for the last 60 odd years to push under that the papacy is the Antichrist. To push under the rug that the apostate Protestant churches are Babylon fallen since 1844. Those messages are getting pushed and pushed and pushed so that we never hear them anymore. And that has been the trend of the current general conference president. They use the excuse that they want to solve everything so we don't bring on persecution. You hear that, you hear that excuse. In the end. Well, you know, that's an interesting point, sir. I've heard that repeatedly, repeatedly. You know, your books, your books are going to bring persecution upon us ahead of time. You know, my response always is, well, you know what? We have been making that excuse for so long. We should have been out of this world decades ago. Amen. You see? So if, if my books were to bring persecution to Seventh-day Adventists, it would still be past time. Yeah, you know, um, it was in Oregon. 
It was in Silverton, Oregon. We mass mailed the enemy unmasked. The local Adventist church, and I'm sharing this story to show you the trend within Adventism. The local Adventist church in Silverton wrote a lengthy article in their newspaper. And in there, they denounced the writer of the enemy unmasked. They said, he, he is claiming to be an Adventist by the message, but he is really working for another spirit. And he is, he is uh, hurting the drive for ecumenical unity in our community. Translated, all the guy was saying was, is we as Seventh-day Adventists in our area, we're trying to become just like our evangelical apostate Protestant brethren. Right. And anybody that would denounce the apostate Protestants as the image of the beast, or as Babylon fallen in the, the second angel's message, or anybody who would claim that the papacy is the Antichrist, they're evil. See, I became evil when we promoted my books in that town. Why? Because I tried to show the distinction in my books between the truth of God versus the apostasy in the religious world. I became led of the devil. Now that's the trend in Adventism. How they'd have to answer too, why did they join the health system of the Catholics? I mean, yeah. I mean it's kind of a hard question. Eternal way. burning hell? Uh, we believe in a God who believes in eternal burning hell? It's that's the evangelical world for you. Yeah, but about Absolutely not. Health system and all yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, you're joined in that, so what else are you going to do? Now in October, so, July, August, three months after Elder Wilson's original message at the General Conference in July of 2010. He gave another sermon that was at the annual council in Silver Springs, Maryland, October 8th to 13th of 2010. If you want to listen to this, it's right on YouTube. I didn't pull this out of the hat. It's right there. His sermon was called, Remember Your Name. And in this sermon, he listed seven different groups that need to remember their name. Six of the seven are pretty clear. However, the seventh one leaves, excuse me, the three shouldn't be there, leaves much to be desired. Well, the seventh group, this is what he said. To independent groups or ministries who have found themselves somewhat distant from official church connection and have accepted tithe for support. Okay? So he is talking, and I'm going to make this very personal at this moment because I have an independent ministry. Ted Wilson is talking to me and to all other independent ministries. And this is what he says. Contact your local church and local conference and return to a warm and appropriate relationship, refusing to accept tithe and encouraging members to return their tithe through the storehouse of the local church. Remember your name. Now friends, what Ted Wilson was asking me to do was Number one, to disband the church group that I have in Central Florida. To go to either the Mount Dora or Apopka Seventh-day Adventist churches where they have rock music. They use any and every kind of Bible translation. They do not use the spirit of prophecy. They do not believe in the nature of Christ as we taught it for 150 years. And so Ted Wilson is calling on me to go to one of those churches and to establish a warm and appropriate relationship with them. Now, folks, a few years ago, I visited the Apopka Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
It was during a holiday time and I was taking a break. And um, so I went there with my family. And in the Sabbath school program that morning, they had one general class, very large in the sanctuary. The man got up and was talking and he was quoting from the New International Version. And he rather smirkingly stated, he said, I hope nobody here today has any ill feelings about the NIV. Well, you know what? I raised my hand. <laughs> and I said, sir, I do. Well, you know, he ignored me. And he went right on with what he was doing. Now, folks, if I know what a Seventh-day Adventist believes, okay, if I know what a Seventh-day Adventist believes, and I know what Bible I should be using, and I know, because I've studied what I believe, how, how am I going to be able to establish a warm and appropriate relationship with somebody who believes the exact opposite of myself. Shut up, That's like our Conference Church now, all the conferences are all going to NIV. That's what they told us. The there are still one. I, I, I can't handle it. Our minister down in Florida, way back, uh, advocated the NIV and the New American Standard, and both of them, from one time to another, and he encouraged all of us to get those. Well, I got them, and I started to compare them. And I took them back, and I threw them on his desk, and I said, I won't have any part of this. Amen, Amen. Jerry. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Bill? Amen. What well, wanted them that call good evil and evil good? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, folks, it's, it's what he is saying here. Is, is not reality. It's not reality. It's impossible for there to be relationship and fellowship with people who do not know what they believe and do not know what Bible to use. It's impossible. And then for me to refuse to accept tithe and to encourage people to return it so that people can deceive Seventh-day Adventists? I can't do that. I can not, and I will not do that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In the first place, in uh, Spalding McGann testimonies, she says tithe is for the regular lines and irregular lines. Where is that, Roberta? That is only in the old edition. The new edition, that was taken out. What old Where it edition? Says, the older edition, the oldest edition on the Spalding and the Gantt oh. has the books. The, the newer one, they have only regular lines. Okay, Spalding McGann Collections, that volume, which one? It's only one. Only one volume. Do you remember the page? Yes. 190. 190. Thank you. Thank you. That's going to be one of my next brochures is the story. Yay! They've also launched, okay, the Great Controversy Distribution Campaign to reach over 127 million people, which Ellen White said should be at the top of the list of her books to be given to the people of the world. But a major complication with this effort was embedded into the plans before it was even launched. It was decided to delete a few sentences from the text as it was no longer a teaching that the general conference leaders believed. They said they could not tell people that the Pope was the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. They said that Seventh-day Adventists did not believe the Pope was the Antichrist so they deleted those statements that said he was anti-Christ. A friend had accessed the Great Controversy website for the project and she read the following statement. Do you believe that the Pope is the Antichrist? Yes. The answer was no. 
The Adventist Church does not teach that any specific person on earth is the Antichrist. We believe the Antichrist is Satan, who opposed Christ and rebelled in heaven. Now, if we take that and we put that into Revelation 14, it would read then, if any man worship the devil and his image. So, according to this, friends, it complete, it butchers, it butchers the third angel's message. That's what it does. It says, we believe that any person or system that seeks to take Christ's rightful place or oppress his followers at any time acts in the spirit of the Antichrist. When I went to the Great Controversy site a little later, the statement was missing. I then wrote the Great Controversy site and received the following. Why did you remove this statement? It was written to Lisa Rasmussen. Do you believe the Pope is the Antichrist? No. Now this was the statement that was removed. Okay? The lady wrote back, Lisa Rasmussen emailed this gentleman back and said, Dear Richard, in the time since that the FAQ uh, was originally posted, many divisions, including the North American Division, have decided to distribute an abbreviated version of the Great Controversy rather than the full text. The FAQs were designed to address questions that would be raised in the minds of non-Adventist readers of the book. Since the abbreviated version approved for this project doesn't include the word Antichrist, we got to thinking it would be better not to answer a question the reader would not be likely to ask after all. So the point, friends, when they originally thought they'd send out the full Great Controversy text, they put in a question about, do you believe the papacy is the Antichrist? But, when they got rid of all the statements that pinpointed the papacy as the Antichrist and decided to come out with this, they just deleted the question because it was no longer important or necessary. We have continued since Ted Wilson came into office to have ecumenical speakers that have come to Adventist institutions. In February 2 of this year, at the Seminary Scholarship Symposium at Andrews, Michael Kinneman gave a talk entitled The Ecumenical Movement and Why You Should Be Involved. Dr. Kinneman has been a leading, if you go and look for a biography of this man on Google, on the internet, you will find that he has been an, a leading ecumenical leader in America for the last several decades. And he was invited to, to Andrews University to tell Seventh-day Adventist young people why they should be a part of the ecumenical movement. You know what that does? That destroys angel number two and angel number three. Again, folk, a trend. A trend. And Ted Wilson has not stopped it at all. In July, let's see, Seventh-day Adventist church leaders yesterday called on members of local congregations to increase collaboration with local governments and health officials when conducting public health outreach. Oh, no. Is that the purpose of our health message? No way. No. To unite with local agencies, folk, the health message is the right arm of the message. It's to bring people to the greater truth of the three angels' messages. That's the purpose of the health message. Do you think anybody is going to be brought to the three angels' messages when it is united with local agencies? No, not very well. Adventist Church President Ted Wilson and Pan American Health Director Myrta Rosas Periago signed a memorandum of understanding that will formalize collaboration 
as the two organizations continue public health initiatives. The signing ceremony took place Tuesday, July 26, in the executive conference room at the Adventist Church's World Headquarters. What year was this? I believe that was in 2011. Folks, if you go back, write down some of these names. Write down this lady, uh, Myrta Rose, Roses Periago. She's a part of the Pan American Health Organization. Oh, this information's right on the internet. Right on the internet. The connecting of the Adventist health message with worldly organizations completely destroys the purpose for the health message. Also destroy the health message. Absolutely. They'll be, they'll be promoting force force and Drugs. Drugs, and that's not the medical missionary work at all. This is the statement. The move follows several years of church leaders seeking to increase the global denomination's health outreach, as well as the PAHO's, that's the Pan American Health Organization's goal, of strengthening faith-based partnerships for more effective health awareness and education in local communities. Ted Wilson says it will be a great privilege for us to cooperate in whatever way we can according to our abilities and our use of health applications that will help the quality of life improve for many thousands of people. Folk, on the surface, that sounds good. To help thousands of people with their health, you said, great. But folk, the health message we've been given as Seventh-day Adventists was not for the purpose to unite with world organizations. It was to be the right arm of the Advent message. March 1 to 5 of this year, the Alumni Association School of Medicine in Loma Linda celebrating the 80th postgraduate post convention. One of the featured speakers there was Greg Boyle, a Jesuit priest. Yep. Mission Emphasis, Vespers Friday, March 2, 7 p.m., Loma Linda University Church. Greg Boyle, Jesuit priest. You say, now wait a minute, Bill, Let, let's be fair, let's be fair with Ted Wilson. Ted Wilson does not run Loma Linda, nor does Ted Wilson run Andrews University. He is simply the president of the general conference. He does not make all these decisions to invite these people in. That's true. However, is that right? No. It's not right. Almost every single one of Ted Wilson's sermons are on YouTube. There, there's one guy on there I noticed when I was looking for a few select sermons of his to research. There's a, a guy there that's got a list of I don't know how many sermons he's given. You know what, folks? You go back and listen, if you have the time. Listen to his sermons, and you find one time where the president of the General Conference condemned this man going to Andrews University. You find one time when Ted Wilson condemned having a Jesuit priest at Loma Linda University. You say, oh, but Bill, that wouldn't be very nice. You know what, folks? When I was in Loma Linda about three weeks ago, and I was talking on spiritual formation because I was asked to, I mentioned Ted Wilson's involvement in it. And a gentleman became furious with me during the, the discussion. He became livid with me. And during the meeting, let me know, and everybody in the room, that he was upset with me. Folk? The question we have to ask ourselves is, is 
Is Ted Wilson, as the president of the General Conference, is his goal to be politically correct? Or is his goal to be described like the people in education, page 57? The men who will not be bought or sold. The men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. You know, that's the question we have to ask. I tell you, folks, I tell you the truth. For a person to get to the position that Elder Wilson has gotten to, they have had to play political games for decades. Right. And I tell you a truth as well. That's right. I stand here in Goldendale, Washington, July of 2012. Folk, 20 years ago, I was fired from the denomination. I knew how to play games. I knew how to be politically correct. I knew when to bow down to people that were higher than me, that put their ink on my paycheck. I knew how to play those games, folk, and I know how to give sermons that are warm, you know, spine-tingly, stories that, that are fuzzy and make you feel good. I know how to give those sermons. And you know what, folks? If I had played those games, I could be in the General Conference. I could be in the Northern California Conference Office. I can play folk too. But you have decisions you've got to make. Amen. You've got decisions. And so, I chose, and I praise God today that I did choose. I chose to speak to groups of 40, 50, 70, but not to play games. Ted Wilson has made choices to be able to speak in the Atlanta dome, I don't know what they call it, the Omni or whatever, to, to thousands of people. So folk, I praise God today. I heard a report where they had a Catholic priest on board at the Pacific Union Company during Ash Wednesday. And they had a priest that put ashes on the student's forehead. Yeah, which yeah. One. Yeah, that, that happened about a week before he came. We, we can be so thankful. I guess the students just take it out. We can be so thankful that we are where we are today. That we can meet and still hear the truth. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Melanie? Bill, maybe you can confirm this then. I married a conference brat, and we were kicked out 19 and a half years ago for passing out their 1911 Great Controversy book. That's why we were cast out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, as Mark was growing up, and in his teen years, he often helped print things that came into the office there at Upper Columbia, where his mom worked. Um, and one of the things he remembers putting together was the um, the things that the pastors were told to speak about. They were given lists of your sermons can be this month. They're, your sermons have to be on this subject. Da, 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 cover this, this, this. You can put in personal experiences. You can put in your own text, whatever. Put in some funny story, whatever. But they had an outline. Did you go through that in the conference you worked in? Or was that just from higher echelon to the Upper Columbia Conference? Melanie, I never had anybody delegate what I had, what I could or couldn't say. What I did have, though, is I would teach Sabbath school classes and I would give sermons, and I would have people sitting in my Sabbath school classes, writing as fast as their hand would carry them across the paper, and then the following week, I would either have the pastor of the church come in and say. Well, I heard that you talked about this in Sabbath school. Explain that to me. And then I would tell him. You see? 
Or, Melanie, the other thing I had happen, and this went on over a six to nine month period, where I would start getting phone calls from the conference office. And uh, I would get visits, frequent visits, from the conference office. And they would come in and they would ask me, um, you know, how the school was going. And they would specifically they'd come in, make sure everything was going okay in the classroom, which it was. And uh, then they would talk to the school board. And the school board fortunately loved me. But uh, so finally, the only thing they could get me on was the messages I shared in Sabbath School and Church Service. Okay. But they never told me. If they had, I would have said, sorry. The, the, the point that drove home that it was happening all over and the man at the top was really orchestrating worldwide what happened was in 1994, um, we were at the Orfino Idaho Church at that point in time. I heard a sermon and then a week later, I was in Walla Walla to do some music, and I heard the same sermon from a different pastor. Two weeks later, I oh, headed yeah. for Philippines on an evangelistic crusade to be their music minister there, and I heard the third sermon. Same one. <laughs> from a, a pastor of pastors in Dumaguete City, and I said, wait a minute, what is happening here? <laughs> By then, I was on, you know, awake to the fact that what he had told me was actually happening. So we may think this guy at the top, you know, is just up there and he can't control everybody. It's just such a vast body of believers. He just, he can't gather up all the fragments and they just do their own thing. I don't believe that. I really don't. I have a, a relative who was personal friends with Ted Wilson's father and she has told me, that he, his father was a 33rd degree Mason and uh, proud of it. Uh, and as the father, so the son. It comes down through the line. If father has faithfully done his job, those, those initiates, those clothing, those books are passed on to the son. We need to be wide awake at this time. And if I may share this, you know, I have people calling our ministry all the time and saying, you know, you need to just... Get rid of your bitterness and come back into the church. God's man is here now. He's the man of the hour. Mm -hmm. And I have shared this with two or three friends of mine that have said that to me. And it's early writing. If we were studying, we wouldn't be saying, oh, do I go back now or do I not? Early writings, page 261 uh, says, listen to this closely. I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists and the fallen churches. And before the plague shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches, will be called out from these churches. Is it time to go back? No. Will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this. And before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies. What do you think this great hope is? Excitement. This is it. In these religious bodies that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is still with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Amen. Amen. Melanie, I'm, I'm really curious, and I know this, this may be an impossibility. Um, the statement about Ted Wilson's dad being a 33rd degree Mason, is there any way, is there any way that there's a document? No, there's no document. But um, I... Am I on camera? Yeah. Look it up on the internet and see what we can find out. You know what? I will say this, whether I'm on camera or not. There was a homeschool group that was funded by the government. I worked for them when I was 18 for a year, pack, uh, not a year, half, uh, half a year, I believe, packing books. They were started and funded by the government because 
in the 70s, a lot of people said the school system is bad and they started homeschooling. The government said, we're losing track of all these children. We've got to keep a lid on these children. We've got to train the next generation. So they paid this man who was on the Board of Education for the United States of America. His name was Dr. Raymond Moore. My aunt worked for him for years. I went to work for him when I was 18. On that board was Ted Wilson's father. He spent a lot of time with my aunt and told her, I'm a 33, third degree Mason. She swore me to secrecy some 10, 12 years ago about this, but God's people have to know, and I am not afraid to die for telling you, because people, we need to wake up and realize there have been a lot of foxes in the hen house for a long time, but God says the light will shine and we need to wake up and say, you know, the, the text that comes clear to my mind over and over as I think about all of these things and try and find my way through the muddle is the Lord tells us, put not your trust in princes or Amen. in the sons of men whose breath is in his nostrils. Amen. Who can we trust? Can we Lord trust God these guys at the top? All we can trust is the word of God Amen. because the men who wrote this book did not breathe while they were in vision. Daniel. He breathed not. Ellen White did not breathe when she was in vision. Amen. Those are the people we can trust. To the Amen. law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. If they double talk, beware, they'll get you. Amen. Amen. Also, I have a document about Figure being a Jesuit. Who's that, Roberta? Figure. Huh? Oh, are our Figure? They were good friends. They spent a lot of time together. Could you send that and to me? And one night he got up to me. Please. I was supposed to send it to Maurice, and I couldn't understand why I didn't get it in the mail because I've been helping pass from the Tula. Oh. And now I hear about the flood. All that would have been destroyed. And so now I know why I held off. I would certainly appreciate it. Okay, you've got to get it to Maurice too then. He wants it. Okay, let's go. Once North Florida is dry, I will see you there. <laughs> I see that. Yes, ma'am. I, I hear all the time uh, that uh, uh, people stay in the church because then they can do the most good. And now is maybe not the time to be leaving the church, no matter what's going on in the churches, the, the structured church. But that uh, they can do more good in the church, It'd be more effective for you know helping people to see truth. Read early writings, one twenty-four, one twenty-five. I, I said people are telling me this. You know, ma'am. Um, several years ago I was in Ohio speaking and a young man came up to me after the meetings. He was attending a church in uh, near Columbus and uh, he said, what should I do? You know, I said, well, what, what are you talking about? So he started describing everything that was going on in, in his church. And I said, have you gone to the pastor or any of the leaders and said, what you're doing is wrong. This has got to stop. This is God's church. You cannot do this garbage. You can't be preaching these, this apostasy. He said, well, no, I haven't done that. I said, well, you need to. And I said, if they respond and they change, then you stay there. But I said, if they don't, then you better get out of there. And you know, ma'am, I saw him about... Two or three years later, he came to another meeting of mine in, when I was in Columbus. And, uh, yeah, he had not protested. He had simply allowed what was going on to immerse him. Because he said, well, you know, if, if I say anything, then they might not like me. Yeah. Oh, jeez. And it'll hurt my witness. <laughs> Well, ma'am, when I saw him a few years later, he could barely think. He didn't have a witness. No. Because, see, the Bible, ma'am, in Revelation 14, 8, and in Revelation 17, it says that Babylon has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we know clearly from the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, the wine represents false teaching. Well, man, if we're listening to false teaching, wherever we are, and we listen to it, and we know it's wrong, and we don't protest, 
Ma'am, what that does to our minds is we begin to think it's okay. We begin to think it's right. And we become spiritually intoxicated so that we can't think anymore. Mm -hmm. Very, very dangerous. For, for confirmation on um, the masonry thing of Ted Wilson's father, um, if you will t go to... Um, now I can't think of his name. The oh, the guy from South Africa that has the Walter, Walter Fife on his um, old DVD set. Total, Total onslaught. onslaught. It's on there of Ted Will or Ted Wilson's father giving all the Masonic hand signs. Um, oh, it's on there. He has Mark. Do you remember which DVD? I don't, but we'll look. We'll look. Okay. Please let me know. Okay. I'd like to read a spirit of prophecy reference in reference to this lady's comment. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're taking all of your time, though. I feel bad. No problem. Um, this is uh, written was written in 1892. Uh, of course, it's Ellen White. It's the reference is 12 manuscript release, page 333. It's also a couple of times appears in our present truth book. And here's what it says. There is a there is little there is a little hope in one direction. Take the young men and women and place them where they will come as little in contact with our churches as possible. That the low grade of piety which is current in this day shall not leaven their ideas of what it means to be a Christian. I just want to ask. Eight, that was 1892. Is it any better in 2012? And that was for the battle for the church. Yes. So, do we have any business being in a place where Ellen White said, if we truly believe she's a prophet, do we have any business being in a place where she said not to be over 100 years ago? There, there's a statement, I believe it's in Patriarchs and Prophets. It says that it's a law of the human mind that by beholding we will become king. This is why we're told to behold Jesus. We're not told to behold the evil, the false, the satanic. It was Cheryl, wasn't it? Cheryl. Cheryl. I think the study you're talking about is called. Uh, Secret societies and their agendas. There you go. That's it. That's the secret name of it. Secret society and their agendas. The secret behind secret societies? No. Uh-huh. Is that it? Or is it hidden agendas? Secret There's secret both secret of those. Oh, one of the two. Right. It's, it's one of the two. But he's got him on there showing all the hand signs. So Mark, Mark promised that he's going to look at which one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. In conclusion, folks. Spiritual formation, abbreviated great controversy, leaves out Antichrist. Antichrist is now the devil. Jesuits are speaking in Loma Linda and Andrews, uniting our health message with the UN. Josiah, when he came in as king of Judah, he saw wrong, he dealt with it. He saw altars, he smashed them. He saw apostasy, he got rid of it. <coughs> Matthew 7, verse 15 says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Let's kneel for prayer. After that, we'll have a Q&A. Ms. Vaughn, if that's good? Okay, let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, please forgive these men for what they're doing, bringing deception, lies, with this great controversy project. Please forgive these men and Elder Wilson for the being on that committee that brought in spiritual formation that is destroying, destroying 
men in responsible positions in Seventh-day Adventism. Please forgive him and all those that have united in this bold, heaven-daring apostasy. Father, please forgive them. And if there is any way that they can be changed to stand for what is right, to stand for what is true, before it's forever too late, I pray for the Holy Spirit to go to them, to warn them that their path is going to end up in destruction and the mark of the beast. Father, please arrest them in their iniquity. I just pray, Father, that you would do everything. I mean, thank you that you are. You're doing everything you can to warn these people. And if you choose, Lord, to use any of us in any way to warn these men before it's forever too late, may your will be done. And please give us boldness to tell your truth, to stand for what is right, to declare the first, the second, and the third angel's message.